All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BEXGS Weekly episode 58, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in the podcast form. And uh, yeah, today we got quite a bunch of stuff, to be honest. Uh, mostly libraries and demos, I think, is the most expensive one. But, uh, you know, let's just get started and see what we have in store for us today. The first article we got here is called From Redux to Hooks, a case study. And it talks about um, a case where the developers decided to build a new app or migrate the app and build it uh, using hooks instead of Redux for state management. And this is sort of the outlines, the takeaways that they found out after doing that for, you know, after using Redux for quite some time and then trying to do the same with hooks and evaluating what exactly changes when you do that. And as they notice, by no means easier, you actually lose uh, some things like out of the box performance optimizations, middleware support, dev tools, time travel debugging, and a bunch of other things. If you are in a position when you are evaluating the migration from you know Redux to uh, just using hooks and context, maybe you were just curious what is exactly the trade-offs are, then do check this article out. It will give you a pretty good understanding of what changes and what can you expect if you decide to move from Redux to pure hooks. I personally think, I mean, Redux, you know, it's a very complex thing and majority of time you don't need it, uh, in my opinion, at least for definitely for small and medium sized projects. I think something like unstated is more than enough, but um, some of the features that Redux provides are quite good. And in some cases it might be, you know, it might be, you might justify using it and you might justify all this boilerplate, but um, there you go. So basically if you are, in the same position, and if you are pondering whether you should switch to Redux from Redux to Hooks, then definitely check this one out. Next article we got here is from Mr. Can See Dots. It's called Aha Testing, and it talks about um, so Aha is an acronym for Avoid Hasty Abstractions, and the idea is that he come up with this spectrum of abstractions that starts on the dry, which is you know don't repeat yourself, the one that everyone using. Uh, goes to the other opposite direction of absolutely no abstractions. And then in the middle, you have this avoid hasty abstractions that basically tell you, you know, do not create abstractions unless you absolutely need them. And um, this article doesn't just talk about the principle, but it talks about this principle in testing. As in when you unit test stuff and first you don't have any abstraction, you just copy paste stuff and it makes it a lot of times it makes it really hard to understand what is going on, right? Because if you don't have any abstractions, in this case, he tests the uh, express function that gets the mocked request response and next functions. And if you try to see the difference between two um, tests, it's really hard because there's like 60 lines of codes that is just basically boilerplate, right? And then if you introduce one simple abstraction, it gets a lot easier. So that's kind of the whole point of, of the post. And then uh, he extends it to testing the React components and also using stuff like just in case and test.each, right? So if you are interested in that, do check it out. There's some really good thoughts and ideas here. Right, uh, next article we got here is from the V8 team. It's called Code Caching for JavaScript Developers and essentially an outline of how the bytecode caching works in V8 specifically and well, majority of other browsers as well. And what can you do to make it, uh, to make your code cache better? And uh, I absolutely love that the first tip they have here says do nothing. <laughs> this is like the best thing ever. Uh, but yeah, there is a lot more tips beyond that, uh, you know, starting from the very basic ones going from the HTTP 200, which essentially, you know, if you send the same script with the 200, the cache will be cleared. But if you send 304, the um, not modified, the cache will actually be preserved. There's a lot of like really subtle things that um, they outline that will help you make your code stay in cache for longer, basically, and be more performant as a result of it. So if you are interested in that, do definitely check out the article out as usual, you know, as it happens, uh, the articles from V8 team are pretty damn great. So there you go. All right. Next article we got here is shaping a butterfly, creating a beautiful world map using open source data and software. So if you are uh, watching the podcast, there's an image on the screen right now, it looks like a world map in a butterfly uh, form, a shape, right? And it's really cool. 
And the article talks about exactly how to uh, create this kind of butterfly shaped map yourself using JavaScript and uh, primarily stuff like Node Canvas, D3JS and a bunch of other data. The code is all published on GitHub. It is a really cool write up. There's a lot of really interesting things here. And uh, if you're just interested in the map itself, there's actually a PDF available for download uh, to print it in A2 format, which is pretty damn big, but it is a really cool one. So if you are interested in stuff like this, definitely check it out. Or maybe you just want this map because it, you know, it looks cool. <laughs> so there we go. Next article we got here is a benchmarking WebAssembly using Lipsodium. So Lipsodium is a cryptographic library and they've added support for WebAssembly uh, way back in 2017. It was a very naive compilation uh, using ECMAScript to send, oh, sorry, the, God damn it. Not ECMAScript, I'm Scripton is what I wanna say. And, uh, you know, now WebAssembly is way more established and obviously the resulting code is way better. So the author here decided to test how it fares. How do you compare the cryptographic library, which is, you know, uh, bound to be CPU intensive in native C version and WebAssembly version. Uh, so in this case, he didn't use the browsers. He actually used the WebAssembly Vasi um, backend. I believe he used, um, what was the backend here? The LLVM backed um, Vasmer, if I remember correctly. And uh, then he compared the sizes, the execution speed and so on and so forth, which uh, is quite interesting. Like in some cases it could be quite good and the slowdown is just, you know, like 1.5 times. While in other cases where you get the very CPU intensive operations, the slowdown can be up to eight times, which is kind of insane. Uh, I mean, you know, WebAssembly is still way, very far from being complete. It's an MVP as a lot of people noted. Uh, and um, yeah, there's the lack of SIMD instructions and stuff like this obviously slow it down. But as the author notes at the very end, slower doesn't really mean slow because it's still way faster than the pure JavaScript, right? So it's, it's absolutely fascinating uh, in, you know, if you have a, even slightest interest in WebAssembly, I would suggest reading through the article and seeing how far it has gone in basically just a couple of years. All right, continuing. We got optimizing JavaScript packages for tree shaking. So it's a very specific article that talks about what can you do to your library code or, you know, maybe you're contributing to something, whatever. So to the code that you actually maintain, to make it more tree shakeable, or I guess more friendly to tree shaking and uh, more friendly to essentially throwing away unused code, right? Because this is a quite important part in making your bundles tiny and in making them more efficient. Um, I mean, there's nothing really eye opening if you understand how the tree shaking works and what exactly, how exactly does the ES modules work. But maybe you are not completely familiar with these concepts, uh, then it's a very good introduction. So make sure to check it out. Next article we got here is domain oriented observability. It is from the Martin Fowler's blog. And uh, if you never heard about Martin Fowler, you should definitely just go into martinfowler.com and read well, I, I would say all of the stuff that he publishes there. Uh, like he's not the only author there, by the way, just to note and it is typically um, software architecture and you know sort of code readability, code maintainability and patterns related articles that don't specifically touch on a very, um, I don't know, how, how do I put it? So, so it's more of an architecture level uh, articles, right? And all of them are absolutely amazing and fascinating to read because they are usually very in-depth and look at the real problems that they encounter while working with clients. And this one talks about observability and code. Uh, observability in the meaning that, you know, you actually have to instrument the code to observe some things within the code, either stuff like KPIs for business or maybe CPU utilization, a garbage collection, disk IO, and, you know, stuff to monitor stuff for performance or for business level, right? And the article talks that the, there's this problem of observability that actually can interfere with the code itself. So um, it actually looks at how you can make that interference, how you can diminish that interference, make your code more readable and make it more testable as well. The cool part is that uh, recently the 
um, including, uh, I think, uh, yeah, so Martin Fowler recently announced that basically they will be switching majority of their code to JavaScript. So this article is no exception. Everything is written in JavaScript, uh, which is kind of cool. So if you are um, working with a complex code, if you are working with observability, if you know that pain, because I personally uh, encountered that more than once and had to deal with this myself, um, especially in the larger projects where, you know, we have a distributed network of microservices, for example, it can be quite a pain in ass. And this article does a very good job of explaining what you can do to make it uh, better, essentially. Uh, it's, it's really good, so I would highly recommend reading it. All right, next article we got here is we built an iMessage extension for our React Native based mobile app. Now you can too. Uh, just as Dal says, it's a um, very, very thorough guide on building a native extension for React Native, uh, for specifically for interfacing with iMessage. So um, obviously React Native is living in JavaScript world while iMessage is iOS native feature and to access it, you would have to build a bridge, right? This is exactly what the article talks about and it does it in a, like a lot of detail, starting from you know creating your own project, adding iMessage libraries, writing the native code, then connecting that code to React Native and then actually calling it from your JavaScript code. If you never built any native extensions for React Native or you know if you're evaluating if React Native would work for you and were wondering how exactly does native extension work, then do check this one out. It does a very good job of explaining just about everything you have to know. Well, I mean, specifically to build an iMessage um, extension, but it also, I think, showcases quite nicely how much effort does it takes to write a native extension and use it from React Native, which is, I mean, there's some effort involved, obviously, but actually React Native makes it quite easy. As a person who had to deal with um, native extensions, in Xamarin, uh, back when was it, uh, what was it, Mono something? Was it Mono Mobile? I don't remember. Whatever, it was connecting Objective-C to C Sharp was not a fun thing to do. Like React Native does a way better job at this. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a really good article and it's a like really long one. So you're gonna spend some time figuring out the code here. Right, continuing, we got let's build a Chrome extension, an article that basically walks you through a building and publishing a Chrome extension, very basic one. But uh, the cool part here is basically that it will walk you through all the steps required from, you know, creating the repo and then registering at the Chrome Web Store and publishing an extension to it. So if you ever wanted to make your own extension and publish it on Google, web store, but still not sure how to do that, then this article basically have everything to get you started. Next thing we got here is understanding event emitters, an article outlining everything you gotta know about event emitters and uh, specific, like in particular with the context on uh, React, oh sorry, not React, why is it React? No, not React, on DOM events. So if you are just getting started or maybe you've been working for a couple of months with JavaScript and you still don't quite understand event emitters, how they work and what exactly happens when you subscribe to events, when you unsubscribe, when you add event listeners, then this article basically has you covered. So just get a look, uh, read through it and you will probably understand quite a bunch more. Next article we got here is web peeing your site, reduce image file size, increase site performance. I also... <laughs> I also think that web peeing your site does sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I mean, I wasn't the one who came up with this title. So there you go. So the article itself is actually more of a tutorial that guides you through using the tool called Sharp for Node.js that is essentially a image processing tool. Um, I think it's an actually API um, bound to the Sharp, either C or, you know, basically native tool that allows you to work with images. It's quite nice. I used it a couple of times to do a various image processing. But in this case, the article specifically talks about using Sharp to convert your existing JPEG, PNG or whatever images to WebP and uh, publish them on a web, which I mean, WebP is a really nice format is very efficient, way more efficient than just about anything else. And as the author notes here, uh, it can give you up to 90% reduction in size. So if that sounds interesting. If you are into you know optimization performance and not even performance uh, size optimization of your uh, applications and websites then definitely check it out this will get you started in no time 
Next thing we got here is a Socket.io tutorial that isn't a chat app. Um, this is basically a Socket.io tutorial um, that shows you how to build a basic dashboard for displaying a real-time sensor data. Nothing super fancy here, but you know, if you are looking um, on a different angle, I guess, on WebSockets and specifically on Socket.io, that is again, not a chat, but has to do something with real time data, then this one is pretty good. So if you wanted to build a pretty basic dashboard for um, real time sensor data, then there you go. This is a good tutorial. Next thing we got here is my <clears throat> apologies. <laughs> Let me try that again. Moving from gulp to parcel is what I want to say. And exactly as Niall says, this is an article that shows you how you can take your existing code base that uses Gulp for a bunch of tasks and migrate to just using Parcel for, uh, if not all, then majority of them, right? So because Parcel is extremely powerful and it can do a lot of things without even any configuration. This is basically the part I love about it the most, I guess. So if you're using Gulp and you, if you're looking to simplify your uh, build workflow, then definitely do check this one out. It gives you a very good um, path to compile your, or to convert your Gulp um, tasks into the parcel with, well, basically zero effort, to be honest. So there you go. Strange premise, hate Webpack because of the config, used Gulp. Um, I mean, Gulp is, not bad, but essentially, if you know, if you end up using Gulp to just build things, then using Parcel would be 10 times easier because Parcel doesn't need config in like 99% of cases. And that is what it, this post is essentially is about, right? So this, the idea is that you can take this huge Gulp config that says, hey, I need this post CSS stuff, I need auto prefixer, I need all of that. And instead of doing all of that in Gulp, you can just say, hey, parcel, install parcel and then install post CSS and you're done. Then you just simplify this one basic post CSS config and that's all you have to do really. So if you are still using Gulp and not sure why would you wanna to migrate to parcel, then you definitely should read through this article because it will simplify your workflow a lot. Okay, but continuing, we got a vanilla JavaScript guide on mastering the DOM. Just as Dial says, this is a beginner level guide that basically talks about uh, working with a DOM using JavaScript. Um, you know, there's not much to it. It's like getting elements, iterating over them, filtering, searching, and stuff like this. If you already know uh, how to work with the DOM using JavaScript, won't find anything new here. If you're just getting started, then this article might help you quite a bit. So make sure to check it out. Next article we got here is Rocking JavaScript Data Structures, a pretty, uh, I mean, I would call it super detailed, but it's a nice overview of existing data structures in JavaScript, including the new ones that has been added in ES6, like typed arrays, array buffers, and um, sets, maps, and stuff like this, with some code samples and comparison of the memory usage and use cases. Uh, again, you know, if you are already a seasoned developer who understands all of those things, you want actually. Uh, need all of that but if you are just getting started and were confused about all of those things this is quite good how performant are typed arrays well they are way more performant than normal arrays because they are typed so v8 can actually optimize for the specific data types right i don't i never have actually never had cases where i had to compare the performance i just know that the typed arrays are way more performance Again, because, you know, it's a known type, so the V8 can actually optimize, or any JavaScript engine can optimize for that type. But um, I believe that it's actually recommended to use them if you want uh, better performance and velocity, I guess, of the data. Specifically, uh, you know, if you use int, for example, a JavaScript engine won't have to care about uh, working with floats, right? Firebase uses it all. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing I'm guessing a lot of people who or a lot of libraries that really care about being super performant would rely on typed arrays where it makes sense, right? Because again, because you know exactly what the type is gonna be in that array, the engine doesn't have to care about cursing types and then you know doing all of that stuff that JavaScript typically does to objects or to things inside of the array. So this is this is definitely gonna be way more performant. But okay, basically, yes, if you are 
Uh, if you want to deep dive into the data structures, then do check it out. There's also some links to the related uh, readings that you can do on just about any of that. Yeah, not much to say that here aside from that. All right, uh, next thing we got here is testing workflow for web components, an introduction to uh, OpenVC tester library. I believe it's OpenVC slash testing, there we go. And how to use it to test your uh, custom web components, uh, in this case specifically built with lit elements. So if you're looking into web components and you are wondering how exactly do you test them, then do check this one out. It basically gives you everything you need to know to get started um, on how to test those. Where can I find the links? Uh, the links are available on GitHub. The link should be in the description for the channel. We also have a bxjs.dev website that should also contain all those links uh, over there. So feel free to check this out. If you uh, cannot find them, just ping me in the chat. I will share it over there. Okay, continuing, we got mastering session authentication, a complete walkthrough on how to build a session based authentication application using MongoDB, Express, React and Node.js. Just as the title says, it's another very detailed tutorial on building a session based auth with Mongo, Express, React and Node. It's like, you know, if you ever seen any of those, this is not too different from just about any other of them, they are in this case, they are not using passport or JSON web tokens or anything fancy like this. So it's very basic, but it's a good one. So if you're still confused as to how do you actually do uh, sessions in Express with React, then do check this one out. If you already know how to do that, you won't really find anything new here. All right. Next thing we got here is design patterns in modern JavaScript development. Um, essentially, an introduction to Three specific design patterns, uh, first one being singleton, the second one being observer, and the third one being facade pattern. And uh, yeah, it just talks what it is, why do you need it, where do you use it, and uh, how exactly uh, do you apply that, and where do you go from that to learn more about the patterns. If you already know uh, all of these patterns, if you heard those names before, then you likely won't find anything new here. If you are again, just getting started with JavaScript or software development, if you never heard about these patterns, this is a pretty good starting point that also gives you a pretty good links to basically a uh, deep dive into other patterns, which is quite always quite nice. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is thank you, simple iterator next, an article that's sort of, uh, I mean, I would, yeah, I guess it's a deep dive into the simple iterator uh, protocol that uh, allows you to make anything iterable, right? And uh, yeah, it's basically all this uh, article really is, it just shows you how exactly to use the simple iterator to make your class object or whatever the hell you're doing iterable and, um, if you know how that works, you won't really find anything new here. I mean, it's very straightforward. If you are again getting started and if you were confused by the whole simple iterator thing, then definitely check this one out. It's a pretty good explanation and we'll get you started with it in no time. Next thing we got here is how to build a web VR game with A-Frame. A pretty basic tutorial on using A-Frame to build a web VR or MR uh, game or XR, I guess, in this case. Uh, there is some uh, minorly weird things about it, like the author here, npm and needs the repo and does npm install on empty package JSON, which is a bit pointless because uh, they end up using the script tags for everything anyway, which just is a bit weird. So they also use npm start to do something, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but there you go. Anyway, it's a basically a tutorial for the um, A-Frame library, which actually looks pretty cool. So if you never heard about it, it's a, a WebGL library that allows you to build virtual reality and mixed reality experiences that is used by quite a bunch of companies, including Chevrolet, Disney, Ford, Sony, Google, and uh, it looks really fancy. Never heard of it before. So this, I guess, acts as a very nice tutorial for getting started with it. Um, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It will guide you through building a very basic app using it and uh, also deploying it to Microsoft Azure because this is from the author is one of the uh, Microsoft Azure team, I assume. So there you go. 
Next thing we got here is how to create a timeline component with React. A basic tutorial on building a very simple timeline component that looks like what you can see on the screen right now. It's nothing super fancy, but it is a nice tutorial that basically outlines how to build a timeline component in React with CSS and everything. Again, you know, if you are a seasoned developer, you probably won't find this interesting. If you are just getting started with React, then this might be quite good because it does show you how to build a component uh, from scratch in a pretty detailed way. So there you go. Next article we got here is pure JavaScript functions as a replacement for Lodash. A brief overview of pure replacement function for Lodash underscore JS. Now, um, while on one hand, this article is actually quite good because you know, it talks about the equivalence of Lodash functions that can help you in some cases. Uh, what I think this article kind of omits is the fact that um, the Lodash functions are actually way more complex than um, the, the native function the article mentions. For example, the, um, what was, I, I don't know, let's take, unique function, right? So in this case, they talk say, so we have the dot unique function, and then you can, uh, where's my, where's my code? There we go. I forgot to enable JavaScript. There we go. Uh, so the code talks about, yeah, so we have this array of simple numbers, right? And we can use Lodash unique to get the unique elements, or we can use new set and then spread it into array to get the same result. What it doesn't say is that actually, yes, this is a nice way of doing it with native JavaScript, but this won't work on uh, non-primitive types, right? So as soon as you get the array of objects or array of arrays or anything like that, this won't work, while a Lodash function will actually work. And there is a bunch of other uh, methods here that essentially, uh, are kind of the same. It's like, yes, you can actually do each on array and you have dot for each natively, but Lodash, each method allows you way more than that. So take it with a grain of salt. Like it's, it's anyway, it's good to know about those methods, the native replacements for some cases, but it's just not everything that basically article mentions. So just keep that in mind when reading it. Okay, um, I think that's actually it for the articles and news. And now we're coming to the, you know, tiny bit sized awesomeness. Uh, the first one here I want to highlight is this CSS Houdini could change the way we write and manage CSS. Uh, this is an overview of the CSS Houdini. That is the task group within W3C that is going to work on improving CSS pretty much as far as I understood in the same way that we got the ECMAScript improved over the last few years. And uh, this is an overview of the what the work group is currently working on and what we can expect to see in CSS in the nearest future, which uh, by the way, looks absolutely awesome. So if you're working with CSS a lot, make sure to check it out uh, because looks like CSS is gonna change quite a bit in the future and it's gonna get a lot better um, just as JavaScript did basically over the last years. Next thing we got here is native image lazy loading for the web. An article from Eddie Osmani's blog uh, that highlights the upcoming loading attribute for images that will basically allow you to uh, do lazy loading of images natively, right? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't need any JavaScript or anything like that, which would, um, yeah, speed up your web pages quite a bit. There's some comparison here of a performance. There's, um, demonstration of how exactly you can use it. For now, this attribute is only available. Um, well, I mean, since Adios Money is specifically on the Chrome team, he talks about the Chrome here, you can get it in Chrome version 75, which I believe is the edge, like the latest nightly builds, essentially, Canary, Canary is called. Uh, and it's still behind the flag. So it's not even uh, there. And um, yeah, but the fact that it is coming is actually pretty damn cool. So I cannot wait for this to land in a production because not having to have additional, I don't know, five kilobytes of JavaScript that manages images lazy loading for you is kind of good. So there you go. Next thing we got here is learn to fold your JavaScript arrays, an article that shows you how folding works. And uh, you might be, you know, if you, if you know what folding means, you probably think, hey, but there's like array.reduce, right? This is kind of what the folding is. 
And yes, this is correct. Reduce is a fold function, uh, but this sort of walks you through how the folding works under the hood basically, and how to write your own fold function so that you understand it better. So if you are still confused about array.reduce method and wanna know more, then well, this is your article, just go through it. Right, next thing we got here is sharpen your web VR skills with experiments from Glitch and Mozilla. This is a collection of demos that are made specifically for web VR and um, published on Glitch with open source and everything. So if you are if you're wondering how to do that, if you just wanted to get into the web VR and wasn't sure where to start, then do check this one out. It's a really nice collection. Next thing we got here is number truncation in JavaScript. That's um, like, you know, there's the math um, primitive or I guess math, how do you call that actually? Math um, class in JavaScript that has a bunch of utilities like math seal, math floor and so on and so forth. Well, it turns out ES6 actually added math.trunk, which actually just truncates the number by removing everything after the dot, which could be quite useful in some cases. And uh, this is sort of the overview of how it works, uh, including the browser support, bitwise operators, and so on and so forth, which is uh, kind of neat. Oh, I, I, I somehow missed that this existed at all, but it seems to be quite useful in quite a lot of cases. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is uh, PSA, essentially Gatsby in version 2.3.0 added anonymous telemetry um, to the core. So if you are using Gatsby and you are sensitive to stuff like telemetry, deploying it on some, I don't know, internal service that should not have anything calling outside, then make sure to opt out of it. So it is opt out, you can opt out of it. By default, it's enabled, which is a bit weird, but um, there you go. Anyway, if you're using Gatsby and are sensitive to telemetry, make sure to disable it. That's basically all I wanna say. Uh, hey Donna, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for your donation as usual. And uh, yeah, appreciate it as always. Continuing, we got upgrading flow code bases. This is an article from uh, Flow Team that talks about upgrading to the version 0 0.85, which it seems like a lot of people had problems upgrading to because of some of the breaking changes. And this article does a pretty good job of outlining what exactly you need to do to upgrade uh, in a nice and iterative way, I guess. So if you're working with Flow and if you are um, having problems upgrading, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is a really awesome thing. So uh, it's an announcement for the VS Code uh, browser preview extension that is now integrated with the live share. So the live share extension allows you to collaborate on the same code base with a bunch of people using VS Code right in the editor, right? One of the pain points of this extension was that you couldn't actually uh, preview stuff in, in the same environment. You know, if you open, if you run the same app, you would still be only able to see the VS Code. So what this actually does is it allows you to use browser preview right in the VS Code and preview the running uh, results and share it with the other person and even you know the interactions, which is just insanely awesome. So if you are doing uh, you know I don't know mentoring or maybe code pair programming and stuff like this, just try it out. The live share was amazing as it is. And now with the browser preview, you can essentially do the same things together, which is just mind blowing to be honest. So there you go. Next thing we got here is, um, yeah, the, I guess the tip that I didn't know existed. You can actually use await navigator.storage.estimate to get the quota and usage of persistent data for the current website, which is quite handy if you are, um, storing um, a lot of data on the client side and allowed quota and stuff like this, which is kind of cool. Right, next thing I wanna highlight is this uh, slide deck from the Microsoft Edge development team that is called Microsoft Edge adopting and contributing to Chromium. So this is the sort of outline of what exactly they did uh, during the migration of Edge to Chromium. And it's there's a lot of interesting data in here, but what I want to highlight specifically is the slide number 24 that lists the services that they replaced or turned off. If you're watching this podcast, <laughs> just look at the number of services. There is 
four columns of services that are somehow enabled in Google Chrome that are absolutely insane. Like, I mean, some of those, I guess, make sense. Like, you know, stuff like push notifications, form fill, smart log translates, suggest, spell check, you know, those are kind of okay. But then in, in every Chrome instance, you have stuff like Google Cloud Storage, Google Maps Time Zone. Why is that there? Google OS Hardware ID. Why, I mean, I guess this is part of Chrome OS. Why is it in Google Chrome? Chrome OS Monitor Calibration, Chrome OS Device Management. Like, why? And um, partially this answers why Google Chrome is slower than Microsoft Edge that is also Chromium based. So if you tried a nightly release of Microsoft Edge, it is lightning fast comparison to Chrome. This slide explains very well why. So if you're curious, do check out the whole presentation. It is actually really interesting to read. And uh, to be honest, I'm actually kind of excited about Microsoft Edge for once because it's also gonna be cross-platform and everything. And it seems to be way faster than Google Chrome. So that is kind of awesome. All right, next thing we got here is uh, Stack Overflow developer survey results from 2019. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, Stack Overflow results. There is some interesting things to pick up here. Uh, so if you are interested in the development market, definitely do have a look through it, at least through the key takeaways. There's some um, interesting things, some very sad things, to be honest, and uh, some amusing things as well. So yeah, if you're curious about the market, make sure to have a look through this. All right, and the last thing I wanna highlight is this uh, new talk from Ryan Dahl from the uh, Node.js, uh, sorry, uh, what was the conference name? Uh, JS Fest 2019 that went in uh, Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, he gave a talk about Deno outlining uh, the differences between the Node.js and Deno, why Deno is sort of why Node.js is still gonna be a thing years to come and why Deno is gonna have its own niche. How does Deno work? And actually showcased the Deno this time around and was joking about how bad it was just a few months ago so he couldn't actually show it, showcase it because it was crashing all the time. So if you have any even slightest interest in Deno and TypeScript, I guess, do check it out. It is quite uh, good. All right, that is it for the short things. Now we're coming to the releases and the first major release we have of the week is the uh, Microsoft Edge Insider Preview, which is the dev build, essentially dev channel for Microsoft Edge. And as I said, it is lightning fast. Uh, for now, it's only available for Windows 10, I believe. Uh, they are planning to release it for um, uh, iOS, uh, sorry, macOS and Linux in the upcoming weeks, I guess, or months maybe. I'm not sure what the timeline is, but it is coming soon. The beta is coming quite soon as well. So for now it's the dev version that basically crashes and you know, there's some bug. I actually didn't have any crashes. They said it might crash, but uh, it was actually working quite well for me. Like I'm really surprised by the performance and by the quality of, uh, well, a lot of things that they changed essentially in Chrome. It might be that one push that Google needs to finally start developing uh, Chrome as a browser, you know, because we already have amazing V8 team, Blink team that does a lot under the hood for the platform. But as a browser, it's actually has been stagnating for quite some time. This has been like a lot, like, I mean, we still have this old crappy develop, uh, sorry, download menu for how many years now? Edge actually has a really cool download menu. So if you are on Windows, make sure to check it out. It's actually really good. One thing that I wanna note personally is the fact that you can actually uh, open Edge, right? So there you go, you can open the browser. You can uh, go to Chrome Web Store. Like you can literally go to Chrome Web Store and um, Edge will ask you, do you actually wanna install extensions from Chrome Web Store? Do you wanna allow extensions from third-party websites? And you just hit yes button. And you can install any existing Chrome extension directly from Chrome Web Store to Edge without any hassle. That is absolutely awesome. Like I was able to install uBlock and uMatrix without any problems within like two clicks. And this might actually make me switch to Edge once it's stable because it's been absolutely amazing so far. So there you go. Uh, if you have any interest in the browsers, do check it out, it's actually I mean, I would recommend you to check it out because it seems to be quite good. All right, uh, next release we got here is MDX version one. It is finally uh, stable. I mean, I think it was 
working quite well already even before that, but now it is version one and there's like not supposed to be any more breaking changes because now the spec is stable and everything. So it's it's quite good. So if you are working with Markdown and wanted to have an interactive Markdown, then definitely check out MDX. It is a very nice language and allows you to do some very cool things. Um, even for writing blogs, for example, like if you write blogs with code, this is pretty cool. So yes, do check it out. Next release we got here is React Redux version 7.0.1. Um, it is a new release, but it doesn't have hooks support just yet. They laid all the groundwork to help them ship a public use Redux hook in later 7.x release. So it's gonna be coming quite soon, but it's not there yet. Now predominantly is basically internal changes and preparations for the hooks, uh, but still, you know, worth upgrading. Next release we got here is VS Code version 1.33 March release. There is actually already an update one uh, with some bug fixes as usual. Again, a VS Code delivering absolutely insane update notes. Um, still remains my best and most favorite uh, code editor, especially for JavaScript projects. Yeah, it's it's like, you know, if you're interested, do check it out. There seems to be a lot of new features. I'm not sure if I would highlight any specific ones. I didn't really find any, um, you know, the ones that I basically thought, oh, this is really cool, but this seems like a nice um, quality of life improvements, essentially. Next one we got here is jQuery 3.4.0 with a bunch of performance improvements and uh, minor vulnerability fixes. So if you're still using jQuery, make sure to update to this one. And uh, yes, there seems to be jQuery 4.0 coming with quite a lot of changes. So it would be interesting to see how that ends up. Next release we got here is PM2 version 3.5.0 that uh, improving uh, serving for single page applications, uh, showing the metric units and divergent environment variables when running PM2 show and also tweaking system D script to auto restart PM2 in case of crash failures, which basically makes it this like this tool is incredibly powerful. Yes, PM2 is quite good if you are not using Docker, for example. If you're just running your scripts via PM2, it can be absolutely invaluable. So uh, make sure to check out the release notes and upgrade if you are still on the older versions. Next release we got here is CLS X version 0. Blah, blah. Let me try that again. Version 1.0.4. Uh, CLA6, if you haven't heard about it, is a tiny library for constructing class name strings conditionally for React, React, and um, essentially anything else, right? And uh, why I want to highlight this release, because, you know, it's minor, you'll be thinking, like, why would you even mention this? Well, here's the thing. Uh, so this is from Mr. Luke Edwards, who are uh, sort of infamous for his super tiny and super fast libraries. So this time around, he traded 20 bytes of code uh, to increase the performance by 200 to 600%. Um, yes. So if you want to construct classes really, really fast, which again, I'm not sure exactly why would you want that, but uh, there you go. It's it's improvement from you know 1.6 million ops per second to almost 8 million ops per second, which is just mind blowing. Um, it was actually quite fascinating to, to read the uh, commit code and see how exactly he achieved that. So if you are sort of interested in performance improvements in JavaScript, then definitely check it out. The Like the code samples is like reading the codes is really, really cool. Okay. Continuing, we got Atom version 1.36 uh, with again, you know, I already mentioned this more than once, Atom release notes has been underwhelming for quite some time. And I'm still very curious to see where the whole Atom VS Code thing will go because both are now Microsoft owned essentially, right? And uh, I'm, I'm just curious how this one will resolve. But um, there you go, if you're using Atom, make sure to update. There seems to be some uh, minor improvements here and there. And uh, yeah, that's basically it, I guess. Okay, and the last release we got here today is Node version 11.14. This is the latest version that is non-LTS and should not really be used in production unless you are uh, li you like to live dangerously. But uh, yeah, there you go. Seems to have some minor improvements and minor fixes. Nothing really of uh, note here. Okay, that is it for the releases. Now we are coming to the libraries and demos section. The first 
Demo we got here is actually the one that's been around for quite some time now, but I somehow forgot about it and it popped up, I believe on Reddit this week. Uh, it's called City Bound and it's a city building game that uses microscopic models to vividly simulate the organisms of a city arising from, from the interaction of millions of individuals. So um, the project um, started, I don't even remember, like two years ago, three years ago, maybe I've seen the first blog post from the author on this thing. And he started building it in WebGL and pure JavaScript. Now it's been out for quite some time and you can play the public demos and everything. You can, uh, if that sounds interesting, you can actually become a patron or donate to PayPal to support the author. Now, the interesting thing is that he actually switched from uh, pure WebGL to a way more complex architecture uh, that now involves using WebAssembly. So he actually writes the whole backend in WebAssembly and then interacts with it through, so, sorry, the whole backend is written in Rust and then compiled to WebAssembly and then integrated in the browser or Electron or whatever, and then rendered via WebGL or DOM for 2D UI, which is, it is mind blowing. I. <clears throat> apologies, I'm honestly not sure. I, I don't think I'm um, <clears throat> apologies. I don't think it's actually open source, but um, there is a ton of blog posts uh, outlining the work on it. And it's really, really, in oh, no, it is open source. I am an idiot. I didn't notice the um, GitHub icon on the top. So there you go. It's actually open source and you can compile and run it yourself if you want to or check out the architecture because this is absolutely awesome. The fact that this exists just makes me incredibly happy. There's also a dev blog that is absolutely fascinating to read. So if that sounds interesting. Do check it out. <coughs> God damn it. Apologies. Uh, the next uh, library we got here is Organigram, a JSON based tree structure with drag and drop for rearranging the tree. Looks pretty nice actually. So it allows you to render just about any JSON uh, that will look like this. And then you can just uh, drag and drop edit this uh, any way you want, which seems to be working quite nicely. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It looks quite okay. And uh, yes, it's built upon the React. Uh, so yeah. Uh, no, it's not kind of like mind map. It's more of a just a tree structure, right? Because it doesn't actually let you connect anything to anything. It's just nested. But yeah, it's like for rendering uh, nested JSON seems to be quite nice. All right. Next thing we got here is React Cookie Consent. Handle Cookie Consent with this a very simple React component for handling Cookie Consent and displaying the browser, uh, sorry, the banner and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to be even more annoying to your users, now you can do it in React basically. <laughs> so there you go. Next thing we got here is Mouthful. Generate a concatenated file of all used CSS on a given website. I guess there is some use case to that. I'm not sure what, but maybe you know. So, you know, there you go. That thing exists basically. Uh, next one we got here is HexGL, a futuristic HTML5 racing game. Uh, this is basically a vibe out in a browser. It is really cool. Um, I think, yes, okay, this is allowed. So it actually works and looks really good. And, um, yeah, so if you are watching the video right now, you can see it on the screen. It's it's actually really cool and it's open source. So if you are interested in building a game like this or were curious how to, how it works, how to build one yourself, do check it out. And uh, yeah, it's 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 just amazing. <laughs> and there's even like Hall of Fame with uh, high scores and everything. So make sure to check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is Compress Broadly, a simple cross Node.js interface for using Broadly compression, just as the title says, a really simple library for Broadly compression. It basically has two methods, compress and decompress. And uh, yeah, you can, you know, if you're you, uh, looking to use Broadly uh, manually for something, then uh, you can use this. Make sure to know that it only works in Node.js version 11.7 or higher because this is when the Broadly API was added. So yeah. Um, next thing we got here is, uh, okay, I, I'm not sure how to read that correctly. I guess utterances, utterances, a lightweight comment widget built on GitHub issues. Uh, this is sort of a comment system for your post blog or whatever. 
that works on top of the GitHub issues. Uh, I think there's been more than one already. This one is sort of open source and uh, no tracking, no ads, always free because again, it's built on top of GitHub essentially. And yeah, it seems, seems to be okay. Uh, like, you know, if you're running a blog and was looking for a better command system, maybe you wanted to base on a GitHub, do check it out. Maybe this is what you wanted. All right, next thing we got here is Stencil.js, magical reusable web component compiler. Um, just as it says, it's, it's a web component compiler that allows you to sort of compile web components, like the native web components. And uh, that, that's basically all it does, right? It's, it's quite straightforward and seems to be quite easy to do, quite easy to use provides abstractions for building those components as well. If you are interested, there's been quite a lot of web component libraries lately. I'm like, yeah, it's just, just another one of them. So if you're working with web components or maybe wanted to start, then do check this one out. Seems to be quite well thought out. Next thing we got here is PIGPIO. This is a GPIO PWM server control, state change notification and interruption handling with Node.js on Raspberry Pi. So it's a Raspberry Pi specific thing. Uh, if you are, if you know what all of those abbreviations mean essentially, then maybe you wanna work with a GPIO C library from Node.js. Then yes, this is basically a way to do that. Right, next thing we got here is Diluter, an automatic Redux reducer, taking the pain out of Redux. Uh, yet another library that uh, aims to simplify the Redux setup which I guess looks okay. Like I, don't, like, I don't know, again, you know, I so far I didn't have even one project that was big enough for Redux, at least from my perspective, but uh, maybe you do, and maybe you wanna simplify the setup just a bit. This one looks quite nice. Next thing we got here is Snake. Yes, that, that's exactly how it's named. It's a terminal-based Snake implementation written in Node.js. And uh, yeah, just as it says, it's, it's a Snake written in Node for the terminal and, um, I don't know what else to say to you. It's, it's like, yes, it's a snake game. It's called Snake. It's basically all I have to know about it. Right, next thing we got here is Zef.js, an easy, understandable, and ultra light framework for defining and using web components. Um, another one for web components. This one aims to be a bit more uh, sort of a, as you know, it aims to be a framework instead of just a web component library. And uh, it's, it seems okay. Does have a fancy website, but does have quite an extensive documentation. So again, if you're interested in web components, make sure to check it out. Next thing we got here is literal schema. Write your GraphQL SDL with resolvers using template literals. Uh, essentially allows you to write resolvers right in your schema, which is, I don't know, it might be useful for small sized schemas, but I personally see that um, at least, you know, from my experience of maintaining large size schemas, well, not in GraphQL, but in other languages, I can feel like this would probably lead to a lot of headaches and a lot of problems figuring out what the hell is happening here, especially when you mix the more complex functions with uh, text with the schema definition. That's, uh, but you know, maybe you want that, maybe you have a simple schema and you just wanna make it all in one place. So there you go. Next thing we got here is Motus, an animation library that mimics CSS keyframes when scrolling. And um, amusing enough, the website itself doesn't really have any um, examples, but there are live demos that essentially show you how it's used on a code sandbox. It's very straightforward. You essentially define keyframes uh, and then it will do something on scroll, right? So it's super straightforward, super easy. And uh, maybe you wanted something like this. All right, next thing we got here is Modali, a delightful model dialogue component for React built from ground up uh, for uh, use support hooks. So it's a hooks based model, really simple, really straightforward, nothing really super complex here, but yeah, you know, if you're uh, looking for a model using hooks, do check it out, maybe this is what you wanted. Next thing we got here is Plop.js, a little tool that saves you time and helps your team build new files with consistency. Essentially it's, uh, what do you call it? Bootstrap uh, generator, right? Um, what was it? There was a name for this tool, wait. Yeoman is uh, generator, right? The, the scaffolding, there you go, scaffolding generator. This is what it's called. 
So it's a scaffolding generator that is sort of allows you to really quickly define a tiny bits of the app that you can scaffold pretty quick. Again, supports prompting and everything. So I guess you would call it a smaller alternative to Yaoman, uh, which I mean, I don't know. It's been quite a long time ago since I've last had a need to use something like this, but maybe you do, so do check it out. This seems to be actually quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is D import, uh, run ES6 module syntax, import, dynamic import, export in any browser, even Internet Explorer. So it's a polyfill for, well, ES6 module syntax uh, that works in just about any browsers. I know that you need promise polyfill if you wanna run in, it works in Internet Explorer 7. This is terrifying to be honest, but there you go. If you wanted to use ES6 modules in older browsers, now you can, and it's, uh, yeah, it's from Mr. Luke Edwards. So it's super tiny and efficient, just, um, a hundred, a thousand, hundred forty-three bytes for the legacy version, which is the, you know, the uh, one that is basically works for ES seven. So there you go. That's the thing. Next thing we got here is Actions Toolkit, a toolkit for building GitHub Actions in Node.js. Uh, so the title says it all. So basically, GitHub Actions is a thing that's been available for, I, I don't actually know if they released it for general av availability. I remember that my account got granted access to them for a beta some time ago, but I don't know if they released it for everyone yet. But this basically allows you to automate things using um, GitHub Actions, which I actually haven't even tried up to this time. I should probably do that and maybe should try this tool. But if you're working with GitHub Actions and if you ever wanted to build your own, then there you go, now you can do it quite easily. All right. Next thing we got here is Shader Doodle, a friendly web component for writing and rendering shaders. Exactly what it says. It's a simple component where you write the contents, you just write your own shader and it will render it in a nice uh, user-friendly fashion. That seems to be quite handy for experimenting with shaders and showcasing them in, well, browser environments, I guess. So there you go. Next thing we got here is N exe or node exe, I, I'm not sure, nexe maybe, I guess nexe is probably the best way to say. Uh, it's an um, alternative to PKG that allows you to compile the uh, command line utility that allows you to compile Node.js application into a single executable file. Again, you know, very similar to PKG, uh, slightly differs in the way it works, so it might produce a slightly different result, but essentially it just allows you to package your node app into one binary, which can be handy in some cases. Next thing we got here is Globby, a user-friendly glob matching. So if you need to work with globs in any case, this, this one is quite handy. I've used it in a couple of projects. It is very good. Next thing we got here is Choices, a vanilla JS customizable select box text input plugin that basically allows you to do multi-select stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a select box. There's nothing super complicated about it. So make sure if you need something like this, don't check it out. Next thing is jQuery terminal, jQuery terminal emulator, web-based terminal for, I like, I don't ask, it exists. It's a thing, it relies on jQuery. It's, it's there, if you need that, do check it out. That's all I will say. Uh, the next thing we got here is FKit, a functional programming toolkit for JavaScript. Um, this seems a lot like Ramda, and I'm not sure how exactly is it different from Ramda or Lodash that also provides um, functional uh, versions of the utilities it has essentially. But um, yeah, that's, that, that is a thing that exists essentially. Next thing we got here is Forever, a simple CLI tool to ensure that given script runs continuously, EEF Forever. It's sort of a lightweight version of PM2 that essentially will restart your script if it crashes. Um, if you ever need something like this, do check it out. It's very simple. I used it in a long, long past, I think like four years ago before I discovered Docker, but yeah, that's the thing that exists and it can be quite handy. Next thing we got here is React Player, a React component for playing a variety of URLs, including Path, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and so on and so forth. There's like a ton of them. Essentially allows you to just uh, quickly render any video you can imagine in a nice React component by just providing a URL, which could be quite handy in some cases. All right, and the last demo we got here for today, 
which is uh, not quite a demo, but more of a spec write-up, is called Web Replay, and it's an initiative from Mozilla guys to create a time travel debugging in Firefox, which uh, is absolutely awesome. So if you're interested in time travel debugging and rewinding feature, um, then do check it out. There's some really cool things in here and uh, some very interesting write-ups, and uh, basically what to expect in the Firefox. All right, that is it for the libraries and demos. Now we come to the interesting and silly part. There's two things I wanna to highlight today. The first one is this um, study from Google. So Google uh, decided to do a study on remote work, assuming that remote work will be actually less productive than work in the office. And they actually, this is a pretty extensive study. So they asked uh, 5,600 employees about remote works and actually disproven that it, it's uh, less productive and proved that this is not the case at all, which is quite amusing. Uh, if you're interested, there's more details here with uh, including the link to the uh, posts by the Google themselves. But it is really funny to see that, you know, the Google set out to prove that remote work is actually harmful and found out that it's, well, basically more or less the same as work in the office. So there you go. That's the thing. And... Uh, Next thing, this is, yeah, this is one of my favorite articles from this week. It's called Windows 3.1 Flash Edition. And uh, it's it's a post from the guy who flashed Windows 3.1 into his BIOS. So he can load into Windows 3.1 directly from the BIOS, which is a bit insane if you ask me, but yes, that's the thing that exists. And yes, you can do it yourself if you want to. So if that sounds interesting enough for you, do check it out. There is... There's a pretty interesting description of how this can be done. All right, that is actually it from my side. This was uh, BXS Weekly episode 58. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, any links that I might have missed, uh, feel free to throw them into the Twitch chat right now. If not, then as usual, you can find all the links mentioned on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev website. We also have a really friendly Discord community where we discuss JavaScript, video games, and other stuff, and also help uh, each other with JavaScript and software development questions we might have. So feel free to join there. Um, if you are curious to see all the articles I find during the week, because this is not all I get, uh, not all I gather, essentially, we have a Telegram channel that includes all of them, or we share the same... Um, articles on the discord in a specific channel so if that sounds interesting to join and just monitor the channel i guess yes uh seems like no more questions or suggestions so thank you guys very much for watching thank you for your continued support i hope you enjoyed the show um basically go and enjoy rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you missed any part of the podcast it will be available as a vod on twitch immediately and on youtube just a tiny bit later Thank you guys for watching. I see you next time. And uh, yeah, stay awesome. Bye.